chapter 25. We're going to talk a little bit about the tabernacle. I don't know if you've ever really read about the tabernacle or did any studying on it. There's a whole lot in there. And there's, there's no way in one, one evening to cover. I mean, it's, it's, it's beyond me. I mean, it, it's deep. But I just want to touch on a few things. And it, it would make a really good study if you have, you're looking for something to study and, and really get into. It, it would make you a really good study. You know, we know as Christians, the whole Bible is about Christ from beginning to end. And a lot of people don't see Christ in the Old Testament, but he's there on every page. If you open your eyes and you open your heart and you look for him, he's there. Christ is really represented in the tabernacle. And you can go up and you can read it in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, I believe it is, where Paul was talking about comparing the earthly tabernacle with the heavenly tabernacle and, and all those things. So, as I said, there, there's a lot that you can get out of this. But, and again, we don't have time to get into it all. I just want to cover a few things. Um, Exodus 25, I'm going to read a few verses here beginning at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram skins dyed red, and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense, onyx stones, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And I'm going to stop reading right there, and I just want to make a couple points and then get into a few things. If you read beginning here and you go up into chapter 31, 32, I believe it is, it talks a lot more about all these things, and we don't have time to read it all and then touch these things, so you read it when you get the chance. But a couple points I want to make here is in verse 8, where God said, Let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. And here we see, and the thing that, that I get out of this is, God's desire is to be with his people. God says that the purpose for the sanctuary was so that he may dwell among them. And, and I'm just probably not going to do it in order or any kind of, of coherent way of things, but I'm going to give them to you as God puts them on my mind. And if you go into the New Testament, in John we read that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God has always had a desire to be with his people. You go back to the Garden of Eden. God walked with them in the cool of the day. He wanted to be with them. But after Adam and Eve sinned, that's separated. <coughs> and here God tells them to bring these things so that they can make a sanctuary so that he can dwell with them. And in verse 9 it says, According to all that I show you after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. But things have to be done a specific way. They have to be done God's way. In order for God to dwell among his people, this thing had to be exactly like God said. There could be no variance. They use cubits and things like that. But so in our way of thinking, it couldn't be off an inch. He gave exact measurements how he wanted this thing done. Exact numbers of things. Everything to a T. And it's the same way. If we're coming to God and we're going to gain eternal life and we're going to be able to come into the presence of God, it's got to be his way. He's given us the pattern. He's given us uh, the instructions, how it has to be done. Just like this uh, tabernacle had to be made exactly to his specifications, we can only come according to his specifications. We can only become Christians according to his specification. And we have to live the life according to his specification. And it, it's important that we understand 
again, that everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of everything in the New Testament. It all means something. And, and to me, if you go back and you read the Old Testament and you see what they had to go through and what they had to do and, and how intensive it was and, and how they did obey the, the strict letter of the law and then you come forward uh, under the age of grace, how good it is that we had that flesh, uh, we had that word who became flesh and dwelt among us. We had the one who would do the things that we couldn't do and, and that he did everything and, and by grace, we can receive it. They couldn't. They had to go through a lot of stuff, the way they had to do things. And I want to look at, the, at a couple things here. As I said, this tabernacle represents a lot of things. You can get a lot out of it. Maybe you got things out of it that, that I won't bring up tonight, but uh, that's a couple things that I want to touch on. As I already said, it, it's a representation of Jesus Christ. It's also a representation of how to come to Christ. It's a representation of salvation. It's a representation of a whole lot of things. I'll touch on that a little more as I go forward. But when you look at the tabernacle, it consisted of an outer court, an inner court, and the most holy place, also referred to some places as the Holy of Holies. So it was these three parts. And when you would come in, the first object that you would find in the outer court is the brazen altar. And you can find that in Exodus 30, uh, beginning at, chapter, at verse 1. Uh, this altar was the instrument upon which the blood sacrifices were carried out. And it represents the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Um, and on the altar were four horns of brass. And um, if you get a picture of this thing, and I want you to understand this, and I'm going to touch more on this a little later too, but it says it was, listen to... Um, what it was made of. It was made of brass. It was a brazen altar. And if you go through the Bible and you study, and if you've ever done anything like this, you'll know this. Brass always represents judgment. And this altar was brass. And we were all facing judgment. But Christ, who became that sacrifice, like the sacrifice was made on this altar, it had to, uh, that blood sacrifice, Christ took the judgment for us. And on that order, when you first come in to the outer court, the first thing, before you can enter in, the sacrifice has to be made before we have any right to enter in. Christ made that sacrifice so that we could enter in. When they came into this outer court, that sacrifice had to be made. It had to be made on that order. Uh, the judgment was death. The judgment was uh, that nobody could enter into heaven. Nobody could go in unless the price was paid. And it had to be a blood sacrifice. And this just popped in my mind. I, I didn't think of this before, and I, I didn't study it out or anything, but it says, on that altar were four horns, the horns of the altar. And I think, you know, of this altar and the cross as being one. On this altar, the animal was slain and shed its blood. On the cross, Christ was slain and shed his blood. And as I said, this just popped in my mind. And you might not feel the same way or think about it. But when I thought of that, the four horns of the altar... Uh, he had the, the nails in his feet, one in each hand, and the crown of thorns. And the four places, and that may not mean anything to you, but that's what popped into my head. Uh, so to enter in, when they first come in, the first thing they had to do was come to that order. They had to face judgment. The blood sacrifice had to be made before they could move forward. The same with us in our day. And again, to me, this is significant, that it was made of brass. And as you go through here, you're going to find out things had to be made of a specific material. And again, I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. But the next thing that you come to in the outer court was the brazen labor. It was a thing of water where the priest would have to stop and, and wash themselves. You have a picture of it? Yeah, yeah we're looking and, at it and talking. And uh, <laughs> if you go in and you read and you don't find it all right, there's one scripture on that, but they had to wash their hands and their feet because they had to be have a clean walk and your hands represent your what you do they had to be clean and in, in their walk and in their activities they had to be clean they had to stop and wash there before they could proceed any further and, and if you read when that when they would go to that there was a mirror on the bottom of that it, 
where the water was, there was a mirror on the bottom of that. And they would have to look at their self. They would have to see their self as needing to be cleansed. They would have to see themselves for what they were and, and understand. And you can't become a Christian. We say this a lot. We say it this way. You can't get them saved until you get them lost. Mm -hmm. You have to see your need. You have to see that you need that cleansing. And, and again, it's the same for us today in a whole nother way. But here God is painting uh, such a, a perfect picture of what was to come. And but what we need to understand is if you read all this, how they had to make it and what they had to go through and all the kind of stuff, uh, the penalties and stuff that if they didn't do things right and you read all this and then you come to our day where we're under grace, how merciful God is to us. Mm -hmm. it, it's just amazing. Uh, but as I said, they, they went from the altar, they went to the brazen labor, which was the water where the priests had to cleanse themselves. And that cleansing, we are washed. <coughs> And renewed by regeneration by washing of the water of the word. And this is a representation of that. It's when we are washed by Christ, who is the water of life, and he cleans us up. And that, that brings us our spiritual uh, regeneration and our, our rebirth and our renewal. And it just, to me, it's just so telling when you look at these things and then you understand that each one of these is a representation of Christ and a representation of how we have to come to Christ. And it's just, it's deep, I'm telling you. Okay, so you come into the outer court and you come to that altar, the sacrifice had to be paid. Christ paid the sacrifice. Then we need to realize that we need to be cleansed. And we come to that, what they call the praise and labor. We come to Christ to be cleansed. They had to pay realize the sacrifice had to be paid and from that point then they go and they are cleansed and then you go into the inner court which is also referred to as the holy place and when you come into the inner court or the holy place the first thing you encounter is the table of showbread and everybody knows what scripture I'm going to Jesus said I am the bread of life if any man eat of this bread he will never die uh, and so as they come in once they have uh, the sacrifice was paid on the cross. They realize their need for a savior and, and they are cleansed. And then you have to take Christ into you. Uh, of this bread that they uh, had in there was a representation of Christ. And we can go back to the Last Supper where he broke the bread and he passed it. He said, this is my body. Take, eat. And I've said this many times when we do communion or we talk about those scriptures. What we need to understand is when you take anything into your body, it becomes a part of your body. When you eat something, your body takes out the nutrients and the vitamins and all those things uh, that you need to sustain your life, and they become a part of you. They spread out through your whole body, travel throughout, and meet the needs that are there. So when they came in here and they came upon the, the table of showbread, again, this is a representation of the body of Christ. This is a representation of the need to take Christ into us uh, so that uh, we can have that life that can only come from the bread of life. And, I mean, you could go into the New Testament and you, and you can see multitudes of examples of these things. But one thing in the Old Testament also is where God gave them the manna, which is another representation of the bread from heaven to sustain their life, which is another representation of Christ. If they go on into the inner court, as I said, they first they come to the table of showbread. The next thing that they find was the lampstand. And again, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. They have gone, uh, the sacrifice was made. They've gone and seen their need for a cleansing. And then they have to take the bread. And then uh, if you notice, I don't know how your picture shows it, but uh, things I've seen of it is the table of showbread's here and the lampstand's here. So it lights the bread and it takes it all. Christ is the bread of life, but he's also the light. You can't see your need for the bread without the light. Christ does all these things in one. Uh, he said that he is the light of the world. But if you go on into the New Testament, when he was going to go back to heaven, he said, now you are the light of the world. 
How can you be the light of the world? Because you have taken Christ into you. You have eaten of that bread. You have taken Christ into you. Now you are the light of the world. Um, they came in. There was a show bread. There was a lampstand. And you could probably think of a lot of the scriptures that I, I'm just trying to keep moving through this about Christ being the light and that kind of thing. Uh, but there has to be an oil that fuels that lamp. And we know that throughout the Bible, oil is representative of the Holy Spirit of God. So in, when they come in there, there's the bread, there's the light, and, and there's the oil. So uh, it's what we need to live, and it's what we need to light our path. And, you know, as uh, David wrote, uh, Thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. We have to have that light to even walk this life. We have to walk in the light of Christ. And that is lit. That light is lit by that oil, which is the Holy Spirit, which indwells us and enables us to see the way to go and gives us direction and, and shows us dangers that lies ahead and shows us uh, how we need to proceed and all those kind of things. So, again, as they come in here, Everything is a representation of Jesus Christ, but not just Jesus Christ. I mean, you can see Christ in the ore because of the sacrifice. You can see Christ uh, where they had to, uh, to wash in a brazen and leper because he is the water of life. You see him in the showbread because he is the bread of life. You see him uh, in the lampstand because he is the light of the world. Uh, you see him in every one of these things, but not only do you see him, you see the plan of salvation. And... If you back up to where I started, the purpose for building the sanctuary was because God said so that I can dwell among them. And this is exactly what it takes in order for Christ to dwell with us, to dwell in us. All these steps that have to be taken. So we, you came in um, to the holy place, the table of showbread, then there's the lampstand and for the lampstand where you had to have the oil and next you come to the golden oil upon which the incense was burned and if you can go back into Revelation and, and find one example where it says the angels are holding golden vials of incense which are the prayers of the saints so this incense here once we have received Christ and we've taken him into us and we begin to walk in the light that is him, we're empowered by that oil, which is the Holy Spirit in us, who is guiding us and directing us. The next thing you come to is where the incense was burned, the table of incense, it's a golden altar, which is a table of incense. And that's our connection with God, our communication with God. Uh, we can now speak with God. We can come and speak and he hears us. Our petitions go up before him and he acts on those petitions. Once we become a child of God, we have that privilege. We have that honor. He has given that to us. Uh, how many of you have had lost people ask you to pray for them? Maybe they know, maybe they don't. I know a lot of them do know because God doesn't hear their prayers. The only prayer he hears from a lost person is a prayer of salvation. But we often forget what a great privilege that is, that we can speak to God. We have that opportunity. Once we are cleansed, once the, he made a sacrifice and we are cleansed and we, we partake of Christ as the bread of life and, and, and as the light of the world, he shows us uh, our need and where to go and we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit and we can come. And this has been said here a couple times and every time I, I talk about it, I think of Kate because of um, she has brought it up a couple times too. That we can come before God is such an amazing thing. They couldn't do that. If you read through here, when God was on the mountain talking to Moses, they couldn't even touch the mountain. Mm -hmm. Under penalty of death, they couldn't even touch the mountain. Do we understand what an amazing thing it is that we can speak to God? It's just, it's really something. But again, through these things, you see the, you see Jesus Christ, who is our intercessor. So, as that incense is burned, it goes up before God. Our prayers go up before God, and we have Christ there as our intercessor. He sits on the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us, and we see all that again in every one of these things. We can see Christ, but through this, all these steps, we can see the plan of salvation. We can see. Uh, uh, what God 
is leading up to. And again, to go back 